Campus Infusion Weekend just started. Let's welcome our faculty candidate, uh, he and me and Mr. Shi Bo Ye from University of Michigan uh, to give us a talk on federated data analytics theory and application. So Shi Bo's research is centered around this uh, federated and distributed data analytics. And he has received uh, several best paper awards from the uh, INFORMS and also IS, uh, RSE and also other uh, re um, um, uh, organizations. Thank you, Shibo. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to this talk. Um, so my name is Shibo. I'm from Michigan. Today, I'm going to present the federal analytics with a theory and application. So now, I would like to first start from the traditional Internet of Things enable system. Actually, this framework of IoT centuries many phases of our daily life. So here, let me give you one example. Let's suppose we have several cars on the road who are enrolled in a tele-service system from companies such as the Ford or General Motors. So usually, there are several, condition, uh, several sensors installed on each car to real-time collect the condition monitoring data from each car. And afterwards, those data will be transmitted to a central location, and the central location will run a big model to analyze those data to keep each driver informed about health condition of their vehicle. Although it's a very promising framework, actually it faces several challenges. First, the data are usually large in quantity. As you can see, this creates a very heavy training and storage cost on a central location. Second, there's a communication bottleneck. In many applications, it is very hard to transmit such a large amount of data within a short time period. And also, this creates a deployment latency because we need to transmit a large amount of data to a central location, so it creates a gap, creates a latency between the model training and model deployment and also decision making. And finally, there's a data privacy concern. In fact, there are lots of drivers who enroll in a tele-service system. They refuse to share the data with the central location because they mention their privacy should be respected by the company. Another example is that in the many medical organizations, we have patient data from different institutes. In this case, it was a law to share the data with the central location. So all those things impose a very huge challenge on the IoT enabled systems. Fortunately, nowadays, a critical change is happening in today's IoT enabled systems. Edge devices have increasing competition power. For example, the Tesla autopilot system has even higher competition power than the Apple Pro. Another example is that our daily use mobile phones nowadays has a computation capacity that is even comparable to our laptop. Therefore, the increasing computation capacity of edge devices really brings up a new computation framework where we exploit the edge compute power to process the data where it is created. And this framework is known as a federated data analytics, or sometimes people call it decentralized training or federated learning. So the idea of the federal analytics is very simple. We use a computation power from edge devices. This credits the investment of AI chips, for example, the Raspberry Pi. So each local edge device, they perform some local computations. And they only need to share a very high level information with the central server. For example, their model parameters or their sufficient statistics. Afterwards, the central server aggregates the information from each local edge device and send the information back to help the device finish the model training. As you can see, based on this framework, we can see a lot of advantages of the federated analytics. First, it preserves the privacy of the local data set because the user doesn't need to share the data with the central location. Second, it allows a very fast encryption for the model training as you can see, each local edge device only to encrypt their model parameter rather than the whole data sets on each local edge device. 
at least further uh, incurs a very nice computation advantage because it allows the massive parallelization to mainly distribute the model training across different devices, so save a lot of computation cost on central location. And this further reduce the computation storage and energy cost on a central server. And last but not least, it also allows very fast large decision making without any latency, because the model training usually happens on the local edge device. In fact, a lot of uh, industrial companies has realized the disrupt disruptive potential of the federal analytics. For example, in Google and in Apple and Microsoft, they start rethinking how the model is trained using the framework, framework of the federal analytics. However, I would like to say the efforts are still in their infancy stage because most of the applications, they mainly focus on deep learning and deep neural networks. This is understandable because they mainly tailor the application to the mobile application where we do a text prediction, for example, for the Google Smart Keyboard, where we're doing the image classification to cl classify the photos in our mobile phones. In fact, we need a lot of development and a lot of efforts to make this idea to become a norm in different industries, such as the manufacturing, healthcare, and other applications. So now, without further ado, let me start introducing what is uh, federal analytics, what is the model formulation. So here, let me go back to the vehicle examples I used in the beginning of this talk. Let's suppose we have several edge devices. We have K edge devices. And in this example, each vehicle can be viewed as one device. We also have one central server, for example, a data processing center or a computing cloud. And now, the goal of the federal analytics is to collaboratively learn a model, a global model, called the F with the parameter theta. For example, linear regression with parameter theta or a deep neural network that is parameterized by theta. Often, to learn this global model, we want to minimize an objective function, which is the average local rate function across different devices. So here, in this formulation, the fk is a local rate function for device k, which can be expressed as expectation of the loss function. And we can further approximate this expectation by decomposing it into a summation of loss function over individual data point. So here, there are some examples of a loss function. For example, if we're doing the classification, we use a cross entropy loss. If we're doing the regression analysis, we're using the mean square error. And also in this fashion, the PK is known as a weight coefficient for each device K, which is expressed as a ratio between NK, which is the local sample size, versus summation of all the NK over device, which is total number sample size. So from this specification, you can see, we will put more emphasis on the device who has more data points. Here, to optimize this loss function, the key challenge is that the central server does not observe any local data set. In this case, it's actually very hard to optimize the objective function. So to tackle this issue, a literature from the, there's an algorithm called the Fat Average proposed in 2017. So here, let me give a big picture of how Fat Average works in this scenario. So at the beginning, a central server distributes a model parameter theta to each local edge device. And afterwards, each local edge device performs some local computations. For example, they're running gradient descent to optimize their parameter. And afterwards, they send a parameter back to a central location. The central location will take an average of those local parameters. And afterwards, we will redistribute the parameter back to a central location, and central location will further uh, redistribute the global model parameter to each local edge device. So this whole process is known as one communication round. And we will repeat it over several communication rounds until convergence or some exit condition is met. So here's a basic uh, 
for example, of the Fed average. Although the Fed learning is a very promising direction, actually it faces also, uh, several challenges. First, the data collected from each HDY are usually heterogeneous. They might have their own distribution, their input domains, or even different output labels. So to be more rigorous, this implies the global model, the optimal parameter theta star we learn from Fed average <coughs> across different devices is different from the weighted summation of a local rate function with respect to their local pr optimal parameter theta k star. So this creates a gap between these global models and also local optimal solutions. And this will further impose a bias and fairness concern because the large global model might work well on some devices, but yield very poor performance on other devices. So it creates a discrepancy among different devices. And this causes a bias and fairness concern. And this brings up the first part of my research talk. I will present an algorithm called the Jiffer FL that tackles the fairness concern in the federal analytics. And this paper recently got accepted in the IGDF. So in many applications, it is actually very important to ensure all the local HDYs have similar performance. Besides that, it's also important to ensure that the devices characterized by different genders, ethnicity, or different social economic groups have a similar performance, along the similar performance across different groups. However, the key challenge is that usually devices with very few data or you know, with an inter uh, unstable internet connection, they might not be favored by traditional training algorithm. So those devices will create a huge loss or a huge uh, bad performance. Despite the importance of the fairness in the federal scenario, actually very few paper exist along this line. So what is the definition of fairness in this formulation? So here, let me give a very intuitive definition for the fairness. So let's suppose we have D groups. For example, we have D different genders or different demographic informations. I would call AI the testing accuracy of a trained model for group I. I would like to say the model one is fairer than model two if the variance of the testing accuracy for model one is smaller. And in some applications where we don't have group, in this case, we can assume each device can be a group. So we can set number of group equal to number of device. In this case, the definition becomes the individual fairness in the federal scenario. So in essence, our goal is to ensure that all the devices they have a similar performance. Or all devices belong to different groups, they have similar performance. So that's a definition for the fairness in the federated scenario. And now let me present our fair formulation. Let's suppose we have D groups, for example, D different genders. Then our loss function can be formulated as follow. Here, let me explain one by one. In the first half of this loss function, we have average loss, average uh, local risk function across different groups. Remember that PK is a weight coefficient and FK is a local loss function. So the first half is same as the traditional loss function I explained before. For the second half, you can see the LI is defined as the average loss for group I, where this cardinality term means the number of devices in group I. So overall, this term penalizes the deviation among group losses. And the parameter lambda balance the model training and the fairness. As you can see, if you use a very small value for lambda, for example, zero in an extreme case, we will put more emphasis on the model training. On the other hand, if I put a very large value on the lambda, it means I put more emphasis 
on the fairness. So that's basically the formulation for the fire model. So here, as you can see, I use a L1 norm to capture the deviation from one group losses. So what's the reason? In fact, by some algebra manipulation, I can rewrite this loss function as a following form. So here, remember that PK is a weight coefficient. And this whole blue term I will explain in the next three slides, but I will first call it a constant term. And FK is the original local rate function for each device. And the product between this blue term and this local rate function become a new local loss function, HK. So what is this blue term? Here, remember that lambda is a tuning parameter that balances the model training and fairness. And PK is a weight coefficient for each device K. And this cardinality term means the number of devices in that group. And RK is a summation of a sine function among group losses, among the group difference. In essence, this term RK captures the ordering of group losses. And I will give more example in the next two slides. As you can see, compared to the conventional federated algorithm, each local edge device is minimizing a new loss function, which is the original loss function fk times a new constant term that captures the ordering of group losses. So how can we compute this blue constant term? Here, let me give you one example. Again, suppose we have D groups. And the group losses are ranging in a descending order. As you can see, the group one has a highest loss value. So difference between L1 and other losses are always positive. So summation of those sine function for group one will become D minus one. And similarly, for group D, because the loss value is smallest, so the sine function will always be negative one. So summation just become one minus D for group D. And next, let me give a more concrete example where we have four groups, and each group has 10 devices or clients. So in this part, I use clients and devices interchangeably. Let's further assume the group losses are ranging in a descending order. And now let's focus on device one from group one. Remember that device one has the highest loss. So R1 will equal to D minus one, which is three, because we have four groups. Therefore, we can rewrite our local loss function as the one plus three. Here, three is equal to D minus one, times the tuning parameter that balances the fairness and model training, divided by 10, which is the number of devices in group one, and times P1, which is a weight coefficient. And then we time our local risk function F1 here. So by the similar construction, we can actually write down the global loss function as the following. So based on this global expression, you can see one key feature is that we will put higher weight to devices that belong to a group with higher loss which means we put more emphasis on device with bad performance. So here I briefly summarize the JFR alpha algorithm here. So at the beginning of each communication round C, the server broadcasts two components. The first one is the model parameter theta, and second one is a constant term I mentioned before, where the RK captures the order of group loss. And after receiving those components, the local device will run stochastic gradient descent to train the model parameter. Here, as you can see, the gradient value of the local device is adjusted by this constant term, where the constant term is affected by the, loss, uh, by the order of losses among different groups. 
And after the training, the central server will aggregate the model parameter and rank the group loss and update our case. And we'll repeat it for C communication run. And you can see the feature is that this term is changing at each communication run, which means that we assign dynamic weight to each device based on the group performance. So in summary, we propose an algorithm called Jiffer FL that ensures the fairness among different groups or among different individuals in the federated scenario. And in essence, our algorithm adaptively update the client weight based on the order of the loss functions. And this updating scheme can also potentially avoid the model overfitting because as you can see from this formulation, we will put smaller weight on the device that belongs to the group with a good performance. So you can avoid the model overfitting on those certain groups with a very top performance. And of course, the value for the lambda shouldn't be too large. Otherwise, this term will become negative, so the local uh, so the device that belongs to a good group will actually run the stochastic gradient ascent to make the to make the loss become higher. That's actually why also why there's a fairness concern. So now let me present some theoretical results for the Jiffer FL. So here I assume each local risk, uh, each local loss function is L smooth. I also assume the variance of the stochastic gradient is bounded by a const constant term, say the k squared. Also, as I mentioned before, one challenge in the federated analytics that devices, the data distribution among different devices, they are usually heterogeneous. So to quantify the heterogeneous, I define a metric called the gamma k as is the difference between two terms called H star and summation of PKHK star. So what are those two terms? Here, H star is defined as a global loss function evaluate as a global optimal parameter theta star. And HK star is defined as a local loss function evaluate on the local optimal parameter theta K star. As you can see, if the data distribution among different devices are IED, as we get more samples, this term will go to zero. And otherwise, this term will become non-zero. So this is actually a very reasonable metric to quantify the degree of non-IED in the federated scenario. And now, let me present the convergence upper bound for the non-convex function. So under some well conditions, and I also uh, ignore loss of constant term because the upper bound is too long. Um, so I can show that the gradient norm square is bounded, upper bounded by this term. So what is this term? Let me explain one by one. Here, the gamma k, as I mentioned before, quantify the degree of non-IDness in the federated scenario. As you can see, if the data distribution among all devices are IID, as we get more samples, this term will become zero. And then it becomes optimal for this upper bound. And this is intuitive understandable. Because as the data are more homogeneous, the training process will become faster. Second, you can see there's a term called E minus one. So what is E? E is the number of local steps for the SGD, which means based on this upper bound, we can see the optimal value for this upper bound should be E equal to one. And this further implies each local edge device need just, just need to run one step of training and then communicate with the central location. And this is actually the optimal strategy and also the most intuitive strategy in the federal scenario. And in fact, in the real applications, because we have communication constraints, or we have a communication bottleneck between the devices and central server. We cannot make E equal to one. Sometimes we need to run, let's say, for 10 steps of local SDD and communicate. But in this case, 
Kavanaugh is E become very large. Let's say I will run one million local files and communicate with the central server. They become very communication efficient. At least not true. Because if I simplify the ratio between uh, this E minus one and also other term, you can see the upper bound roughly equal to the E minus one times uh, this log term divided by square root of C times E. So what is C? C is the number of communication round in the factory scenario. So if I want to make sure this bound is decreasing after I run more communication, I need to ensure the order of E shouldn't be large. So if the E is too large, then this upper bound is now decreasing with respect to communication, which means our orbit will never converge even if we run the infinite number communication round. And this is also intuitively understandable because let's suppose each local edge device, they will train their model to convergence and then they communicate. Then it's become one shot communication approach in many statistical literature. And in this case, the local edge device cannot communicate with each other to learn the information from different data sets. So now let me present some experimental results for the GFRFL. Unfortunately, upon time I finished this paper, there are very few engineering data sets in the federated scenario. Therefore, I will just use the image classification task from the federal learning algorithms. So here, I got the data set from the extended MNIST. In the data set, we have capital letters, we have lowercase letters. We also have different digits. So overall, there are six two classes in the data set. And now I further divide the data set into three groups based on the population writing styles. So recently I read a report about the writing habits of different populations. So some people, they prefer to write a capital letter and some people prefer to write a lowercase letter and some people want to use a mixture when they are filling the form. So in this case, it's important to ensure that the image classification task performs equally well across different groups, which represent the people with different writing habits. And now I compare my algorithm with several state-of-the-art fairness algorithm, algorithm in the literature. In this table, I use two metrics. The first one is, uh, you, know, you can see several numbers here. It's a prediction accuracy for the classification. And second one is called discrepancy that measures the difference between a group with the largest accuracy and smallest accuracy. Overall, the smaller value, the fairer the solution. So you can see the GFRFL, which is our algorithm, achieved the smallest discrepancy among different benchmark models. Meanwhile, the prediction accuracy are comparable to those algorithms, which means we didn't sacrifice the accuracy a lot for the fairness. And this actually credits to the dynamic adjustment strategy for the weight coefficient for each local edge device during the training process. So in the first part of my talk, I propose a framework called GFRFL that ensure the fairness in the federated scenario. And to the best of my knowledge, the fairness is still an underdeveloped area in the literature, and in the future, I will continue this work if I join this department. And now, so let me pause a little bit. So I have a question for everyone. So if I let you summarize my work in the first half of the presentation, just use two words. So what kind of words do you use to summarize the talk in the first half of my presentation? Fairness. Fairness? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, actually, from a, even a higher level of perspective, I'd like to use a word called global model. So what's the meaning of global model? It means I just return a single global model parameter for all the edge devices. And I, as I mentioned before, the data distribution among different devices are usually heterogeneous. 
So in this case, a global model might not work well in those applications. So the most intuitive way to tackle this problem is to return a personalized solution to each local edge device. So the key idea is that we still maintain some global information from the central server, but we are returning a solution to each local edge device. We somehow want to let each local edge device tailor the global solution to fit into their local data set. Another question for everyone is that, what are some good candidate models for personalization? In fact, there are a lot of potential candidates. But here, let me give you one very intuitive example. Remember that we have learned a global model called the X theta using the Fed average. And now I'm asking, can we use a Bayesian approach to learn this model? So basically, we learn a prior on the model, which is uh, called the P, the probability density function for the F star, uh, for the F theta. And afterwards, each local edge device uses this prior information and their local data sets to obtain a personalized solution. And mathematically, this implies the posterior distribution, the posterior prediction on each local edge device depends both on their local data set, which is the YK, and also on the prior information that contains the global information from the central server. So what model has this nice formulation? It's called a Bayesian model. And now, in the Azure applications, the Gaussian process is a very nice model with a Bayesian interpretation. And this brings up the second part of my talk, which is called the Federated Gaussian process. And this paper recently uh, got a major revision from the IEEE P panel. So what is the Gaussian process? The Gaussian process, let's suppose we have a training data set D with the input matrix X and also output Y. Then we decompose our output as a summation of F, which is a latent function, plus the arrow term epsilon. Then we impose a Gaussian process prior on this latent function. Here, this kernel function is a prior kernel function parameterized by the kernel parameter theta k. So in essence, this kernel function captures the correlation among the data points on local edge device. And we'll also assume this arrow term follow a IAV normal noise with a sigma squared parameter. And now, given a new observation, x star, our goal is to predict the output at this location, which is called f x star. So after some manipulation, we can show that the posterior predicted equation is also a normal distribution with the following expression. So here, the k is a coerced matrix that summarizes the correlation or the coherence among different data points. And for simplicity, I will call the parameter from kernel and also parameter from noise as a Gaussian process parameter. Now to estimate the parameter in Gaussian process, the most popular way is to minimize the negative log marginal likelihood function, which has a polling form. So as you can see, in this expression, we have a covariance matrix K that captures the correlation among different data points. So in essence, the Gaussian product loss function features the correlation among data. So why I emphasize it multiple times because I will use this one for proving the convergence of the Gaussian process. And now let me present a very simple expansion of the Gaussian process, the federated scenario. So basically we just use fat average to train the Gaussian process. So at each communication round, the central server broadcast parameter and local device do local training with uh, each type of SGD and the central server will aggregate those model parameters. And overall, we still return 
the global model parameter theta. So how does this parameter can handle the heterogeneous distribution among different data points? As I mentioned before, we assign a Gaussian process prior on the local latent function fk. So if we use a fat average to train a global model theta, this can be viewed as a learning a common model prior for different data po uh, for different devices. And on the other hand, by the definition of the Bayesian updating rule, our posterior distribution, the posterior pred prediction, also depends on our local data, which is xk and yk. So overall, the global prior information summarizes the global information across different devices. Well, the local data xk and the yk can be viewed as a personalized role, personalization role in the prediction. So that's how the Gaussian process works in the federated scenario. Indeed, here let me create a very simple example here. So on device one, we have a data from y equal to sine x. On device two, we have data equal to y equal to negative sine x. So if we use fat average to train neural network without any Bayesian components, we can show that the optimal function form is zero that minimize the average loss across two devices. On the other hand, the Gaussian process, thanks to the Bayesian interpretation, actually has a, our data set as a personalization role to help each local edge device provide a perfect model fitting on both devices. So that's how the federated Gaussian process works to handle the heterogeneous data distribution among different devices. And now let me present some theoretical results for the federated Gaussian process. In fact, proving the convergence for federated Gaussian process is very challenging. So in the traditional formulation for the federated analytics, we usually decompose the risk function as a summation of individual loss function over each data point, which means in this empirical risk minimization framework, we don't have a correlation structure among the data distributions. However, in Gaussian process I mentioned before, we have a coherence matrix that captures the data correlation. So what's the implication? If we take the stochastic gradient of the Gaussian process loss function, then it will become a bias estimator for the true gradient. Well, on the other hand, for the empirical risk minimization, if you take the stochastic gradient, it's become an unbiased estimator for the full gradient. So this incurs a challenge in adopting the traditional SGD analysis in the convergence proof. And furthermore, the Gaussian process loss is now convex. This further incurs a challenge in the proving. In fact, this is the first work that extends the convergence of federated optimizer beyond the empirical risk mi minimization and to a setting with a correlation among data points. So what's a high level idea? First, let me present some assumptions on the theorem. We assume the parameter space is a complex and convex subset of R3 because we have three parameters for the Gaussian process. I also assume the norm of the stochastic gradient is bounded by constant g. And furthermore, I make assumptions based on type of kernel functions we are using. Remember that in Gaussian process, we impose a Gaussian process prior that's parameterized by the kernel function. So if you are using some smooth kernel, for example, the radical basis kernel, I will assume the eigenvalues of a kernel function has an exponential decay rate. If I'm using some non-smooth kernel, for example, the Magnum kernel, I will assume the eigenvalue has a polynomial decay rate. So those are all the assumptions to my proof. So as I mentioned before, the central challenge arises from that the stochastic gradient of the Gaussian process loss is a bias estimator for the full gradient, which means if you take the expectation of the batch of the stochastic gradient, it doesn't equal to the full gradient. And in fact, it's a very challenging to bound the difference between those two components. And actually, I didn't do that. 
So my proofing strategy is that I bound, I introduce a new term called the condition expectation of the local stochastic gradient. And I'm trying to concentrate this uh, stochastic gradient around this condition expectation term. And also I will show that this condition expectation term actually behave like a convex function, although it's still not a convex function. So overall, the first part, the concentration property of the stochastic gradient introduce an arrow term in the convergence upper bound. Well, the convex-like property enable us to prove the global convergence for the Gaussian process. So here, under some uh, assumptions, I will show that with a very high probability, the parameter learned by the set average converge to the optimal parameter with a following upper bound. So what are those terms? Let me explain one by one. Here, remember that E is the number of local steps. As you can see, if E equal to one, this bound is optimal, which means we run one gradient, descent, and communicate. And it's actually aligned with uh, my previous conclusion about the GFI results. And second, we have a ratio, which is E minus one square over T plus one. So here T defines the R times E minus one. So here, remember that R is the number of communication round. So T represents total number of iterations on each device. So if I run more iterations, this upper bound should be decreased. On the other hand, the magnitude of the E shouldn't be large. As I mentioned before, if you run too many, too many local gradient steps, then this bound will not decrease even if we run more iterations. So this also aligns with the conclusion I made for the GFIFL algorithm. And now, what is the second part? So the second part shows that I have an arrow term that depends on a term called MK. So what is MK here? MK is a batch size for the SGD algorithm. As you can see, this term will not decrease even if we run more iterations. And this term, as I mentioned before, came from the concentration property of the bias gradient. In other words, this is the arrow term that depends on the batch size and it's the price we need to pay for the bias gradient. So this basically summarizes the coverage results for the fat Gaussian process. And now let me give one uh, example of how can we apply the Gaussian process in the industrial applications. Um, so actually, in many applications, we have a high fidelity model or a high fidelity simulation, which is very expensive to run the simulation models. It might even take several days or several weeks. So in essence, we have very few number of observations for the high fidelity data set. Therefore, there are a, a major trend of work trying to augment the high fidelity data with some cheaper resources, for example, from cheaper simulations or the closed form equation from the textbook. And this framework is known as the multi-fidelity modeling, where we will help the device with a higher fidelity data to improve the model training performance using some cheaper resources, which is called a low fidelity model. So in our formulation, we assume each device has one level of data fidelity. For example, device one has a high fidelity data, device two has a low fidelity data. And we use a fat average to train the Gaussian process. So here let me give you one example. On the left hand side, I have a low fidelity data which has a cyclic pattern. On the right hand side, I have a high fidelity model which also has a cyclic pattern but they, are, they have different trend. As you can see, the high fidelity data set actually borrow the cyclic pattern from the low fidelity data set so that we can actually fit a data pattern with uh, this cyclic pattern. On the other hand, what if I ignore the information from low fidelity model? If, what if I just run a Gaussian process on this high fidelity model? Then I would just obtain a curve that interprets everything as a noise. So I also test a fidelity Gaussian process on a different benchmark problem in the literature. So I compare my 
uh, Federer Gaussian proves that several state of the art centralized multivariate model approach are based on autoregressive and also deep Gaussian process. So among all those data sets you can see, uh, our algorithm generates the smallest prediction error compared to other algorithms. So overall, in the second half of my talk, I present the personalization technique using the Bayesian approach, where the Gaussian process model can retain both the global information learned by the Fed average, but it can also tailor the solution based on the local data set on each local edge device. And I support the performance of the Gaussian process using both theoretical result and also the empirical result. So overall, in this talk, I present 12 of my paper in the federated analytics. They basically tackle the challenging problem in fairness and also uh, in the statistical heterogeneity problem. So from a higher level idea, I'm interested in developing first the federated statistical models and apply them to solve important engineering problems. Because in many engineering applications, we are interested in, for example, uncertainty quantification, hypothesis testing, and variable selection. And in the current literature, there are very few statistical models exist along this line. I'm also interested in tackle statistical heterogeneity problem in the federated scenario. I'm interested in developing the personalized model to tackle the naive distribution among different devices. But I'm also developing some way to cluster the devices with uh, different data distributions. And finally, I'm also interested in developing some algorithm that targets fairness and privacy. And my main application will stay within the manufacturing and the healthcare domain. So after I join this department, I will start collaborating uh, with uh, Dr. Han Tiang Qing from this department. So currently we are working on a project called the Optimal Collaborative Design for the Manufacturing System using the idea of the federated analytics. So basically, in the 3D printer example, we found to print out the profit products when to tune a lot of process parameters either from simulation or from other techniques. And each experiment of just one set of parameters will take a very long time to finish. And now, with the increasing connectivity and the computation capacity of local edge device, I'm asking whether different 3D printer owners they can collaborate with each other in order to reduce the effort for the trial and error. And this is a very challenging topic because usually the different 3D printers they may have a different data distributions, or they are printing different products. So how to handle the statistical heterogeneity problem is a very interesting and challenging topic along this line. For a long-term perspective, I'm also interested in generalizing my prototype to the variable devices. As nowadays, people are using variable devices, for example, Apple Watch, to monitor the health condition of different patients. And now, with, with uh, healthcare information data from each individual, I'm asking whether we can train a very large scale federated healthcare model without letting each patient share their data with a central location. Meanwhile, we can also return a personalized feedback on the patient's health medication advice. And let's briefly summarize uh, my research plan and also my today's talk. Thank you very much. I will take any questions. So any question? Hi, I have a question regarding your convergency, the theorem. Um, the, the first process? one, the first one, not the Gaussian one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. No, you, do, you do not need to see the slides. Okay. I'm just uh, curious, you said in, on a mild condition, Typically, this kind of a convergence proof relate with starting point. Right. Yeah. So, is this your mild condition related any like starting point? Yeah. Uh, the requirements. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It depends yeah. on starting point. So, if you check the the bound, if you check upper bound, we have a term that is a different. I'm sorry. There's a difference between your initial point, the loss value for initial point, and also for the optimal, optimal loss so value. So, the mild condition indeed relate with your. Starting point, right? Right, right. Okay. And this basically a common problem for you know almost all the yeah for all models. the average models. Yeah, yeah. Good. 
Any other question? Actually, I have a question on the same same slide. It has to do with uh, this um, measure of discrepancy gamma k that you define. Is is this related in any way, or did you try to do it? I think a more. I mean, most people when they talk about differences between distributions, they say there's other measures. There's like Wasserstein, or there's like formal norms. Where you does this gamma k? I don't see how this necessarily could be bounded by, you know, norms on the difference of me of the different probability measures? Or can you get a re similar result where you don't use gamma k, but you use like a, a difference between the measures of the? Oh, that's a, a very excellent question. So currently I'm using the metric actually, um, so this metric is widely used by a lot of, uh, you know, the federal literature improving the convergence results. Um, and I agree that in the future, I can probably replace this metric because we usually have a different definition for non ideas based on our applications or based on different domains. And of course, we can replace this definition by other measures, for example, as a Wasserstein distance between distributions. I think that's a very interesting topic to work along this line. And actually, I didn't see any literature doing that uh, currently. I think it'll be very interesting uh, extend, uh, for that to extend the convergence results uh, using other non-ID measures. Uh, so I don't know anything about this literature, but this is a pretty common measure, like in federated yeah, right, deep right. learning or whatever. Yeah, this yeah, is actually, what they, if they don't have the same distribution with the different agency, this is what they use. Is the right. Measure, which is specific to a particular optimum, right? Which is different than the. Okay. Yeah, right. Just, right. I actually have uh, uh, two questions. The first question is about the fairness formulations. Can you explain, like, uh, application, when the fairness, uh, like, formulation will be needed? So my, 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 my main question is uh, why do we need, like, a global model theta applied to different, like, uh, local models? Well, local model can be heterogeneous. Why? Can you uh, give uh, one application, like, <coughs> this setup makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, excellent question. So, uh, so first, what is the application of this formulation? For example, in the manufacturing. So let's suppose, uh, as I mentioned before, I have a collaboration work with Dr. Han Tang Tian. So we have a different 3D printer, which can be used as different devices. So we are collaboratively find the optimal process parameter to improve the printing process, improve the printing colors. As I mentioned before, you know, different 3D printers, they might have a different, you know, they operate under different environment or they have a different characteristics. So this actually incurs um, a naive distribution among different data points. So if you train a model, if you ignore, totally ignore the fairness term, you just train the model by minimizing average loss. Then for example, the printers with more data or printers uh, with a very well behaved data will generate with a global model that has a lower prediction uh, error for some printers. But on the other hand, other three printers will perform, perform bad. Um, so I think another question is you ask why we use a global model for fairness rather than use, for example, personalized solution. No, um, can, uh, going back to what you yeah. described scenario, uh, the 3D printer are all different. So in that case, it is, will be more meaningful. Will that be more meaningful? Use a different theta in different, glo uh, in different 3D printer instead of using like a global theta, try to take care of all the printer. Yeah. I think that scenario will make more sense, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Actually, in our paper, we also tailor the GFI RFL to the personalized version, where besides this global model, we also return a personalized solution to each local edge device. So basically, we slightly modify the formulation uh, to let the, so, so we'll communicate in the local solution with the central server, we also maintain our local solution that uh, quantifies the for example, some information from local data set. So in the talk, I didn't present a personal formulation because first, we, we have time limitation, and second, it also overlaps with, uh, you know, with the uh, purpose of the federal Gaussian process, which I want to talk about the personalized model in the federal scenario. So overall, if the data are heterogeneous, the data distribution among different devices are different, the global model doesn't really make sense. So we need to use the personalized model to help each device to handle the non-ideas in the data distribution. And in my research, both uh, the, so the GFRFL model, they have both global 
model developer have personal support. And even for the Gaussian Poisson formulation, I also have a global model formulation and also a personal formulation. Yeah, thank you. So the second question I have is, uh, uh, yeah, so one assumption, major assumption is assume uh, the local device and the global device somehow can be shareable through some parameter theta, yeah. right? And the theta dimension is the same. But in practice, the, because of the 3D, uh, 3D printer, right, as you described, they work in different environment. There may be an environmental parameter specifically for one printer. In this case, the theta meaning and also the dimension will be different. So how could, in this case, can we still yeah. apply the federated learning? Or? Yeah, definitely, that's a very excellent question. So actually, for the scenario, for example, different 3D printers have different number of parameters. In this case, we don't need a central server to aggregate both parameters. Actually, we can do the completely centralized training where I introduce a global latent variable to capture the uncertainty among the data distribution on, over different devices. So each local edge device, they mainly use the information from this global latent variable. It doesn't depend on, for example, the number of parameters in the, in the 3D printing process. So they can be doing their local training, but they somehow still borrow very high level information uh, from, from different 3D printers because we're still working on the 3D printer, working on some similar problems. So they somehow should share some basic information that can be, that we can achieve the knowledge transfer across different devices. So I suppose if all the devices are totally different, we're doing completely different printing process. In this case, the federated analytics become meaningless in this scenario. Yeah, the scenario I imagine is to share some of the data. Yeah, share not, some similarities, yeah. right? So we can still learn some information from, uh, from each local edge device. So for example, in neural network, we can develop some common layers that allow each 3D printer to learn some shared information across different data sets. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, we can also have some personalized layer for each local edge device to let them still training their own model. And if you can see, you can have a different number of model parameters in this example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more question? Okay. So, like, thanks for our speaker again for this Thank intriguing talk. Thank you.